I think we have come to good evening. <laughs> and um, thank you all for spending the day with us, and thank you all for sticking around. And um, it's funny, this reminds me, uh, in a previous life, um, I would play CBGBs often, and I was often playing the spot after the headliner. I was in this band, <laughs> I was in this band where we actually had what was known to be the latest arriving, longest drinking audience. So CBGBs would, would, would book us for that spot, and CBGBs wasn't a big place. It held like maybe 200 people at the most, we would squish them all together, and there'd be 200 people there for the headliner, and then 185 of them would leave, and we would bring in 185 new people at like two in the morning. And they were very serious about drinking. And so we provided the musical accompaniment. So anyway, so I'm used to this spot. The spot at the end of the day where things have settled down. Um, I wanted to open with a, 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 the title for what I decided to talk about was um, It Takes Parentheses Even More Than a Village. Um, and there's something after the colon, which is uh, a mindful team approach to wellness and recovery. And so I'm going to try and explain to you what I mean by that, essentially. Um, two stories to start, both involving my friend Dave, um, who in the great AA tradition, that's where I met him, um, had no last name. And so everyone uh, often gives each other nicknames so that we can identify which Dave you're talking about. And his two nicknames were One Dave at a Time. I don't know how many times that's been done to people. But his other nickname was, pardon my language, but it was his nickname was Fucking Miracle Dave. And that was because at every AA meeting, uh, when he said, hi, my name is Dave, I'm an alcoholic, he would then say, and it's a fucking miracle we're all sober today. And he did that for 12 years until one day he, he said, hi, I'm Dave, an alcoholic. So anyway, today was an interesting day, and the whole, everyone was like, oh my god, there's no more fucking miracle. Um, anyway, so uh, Dave was a true beatnik. He was like the real deal. He had the goatee and a saxophone. And the way we met was his, uh, a sponsor of his pointed me out in the meeting and said, go talk to the guy with the same beard as you. I had like a little goatee myself. And... You know, we make our connections however we make them. And he came out for coffee with us after the meeting, and then he, he told me this later. He went into the bathroom, and he shot up, and came back out and said, hey, I'm really enjoying this coffee with you sober guys. Anyway, um, a few days later, I got a call from him. He was in St. Vincent's, which is no longer there in New York. And I went to visit him uh, often. And I took him out on a pass, and we went for a walk, and we went for Thai food, and we ran into some of my buddies, and he's like, wow, all these nice people buying me lunch and all this good stuff. And we get to the end of the day and we give each other a big hug. And I, I'm like, I'll see you later. And I leave. And this is what he describes afterwards is what happened was he was he watched me walk away and he thought to himself, I'm going to go get loaded. And he said, then what happened is the kind of thing that happens in New York and New York only some Charlie Parker, he is a sax player, some Charlie Parker came wafting out the window. And he said in that true sort of beatnik, been doing drugs a long time, I'm in early recovery sort of, and I'm kind of hallucinating way, he said, the saxophone said to me, yo man, I made this sound despite the drugs. And he was like, Ugh. and he went back into the rehab and he's sober 21 years now. So um, but the reason I bring up that story is that he responded to something that was intrinsic in his life, music, that had been previously completely intertwined with the drugs. And it needed to be kind of extricated from each other in order for that piece of him, that music, to become part of his wellness again, as opposed to his demise. Because I know that at the end of my music career as a, as a using person, they had become so intertwined that all I could think of uh, drums were for 
were to get free drugs and maybe get a date. And that was it. I didn't love music anymore, it didn't feed me, nothing like that. So for me, the wellness is all inside all of the clients that we meet, it's all inside all of us. And it's just layer upon layer upon layer of, of nonsense, you know, whether it's trauma or um, just life experience or continued addiction that is just covering it. And so what we do here is we just uncover it. The other story is another Dave story. It's not really, it's actually more of a Dave one-liner. He had lots of them. Um, and he said, yo, man, sometimes I'm having a bad day and I'm thinking I need like to change my therapist or change up all my meetings or break up with my girlfriend. And then I realized I just need a cheeseburger. <laughs> <laughs> Which is getting down to some of what some of our speakers said today that, you know, and there might be a more well way to fill that hole. Um, Dave actually went on this diet Diet um, when he got sober. He was emaciated, completely emaciated when he got sober uh, and clean. And he actually went out and every day he ate um, bacon and eggs and sausage and pancakes for breakfast. And then like a bacon cheeseburger and two orders of fries. For, he gained like 50 pounds in the first eight months of his recovery. And then one day he just was like, all right, I'm done. <laughs> and proceeded to start to eat normal. Anyway, um, so the point there being that the mindful part of the mindful team approach to wellness is that we need to be mindful, or I need to be mindful at all times of finding out what the next appropriate thing to do for my wellness is. And that I might think it's you know this huge ex existential trip, but it might just be that I forgot to eat lunch. So if I can really check in with myself and day, moment by moment, day by day, week by week, really just track that, that's all mindfulness is really. I mean, I could get real complicated about that, but I won't in a short talk. But mindfulness is this tracking, this awareness, you know, which is why I was so grateful when Bernie discovered EMDR and introduced it to me and I find EMDR to be, you know, I actually consider it a mindfulness therapy. Um, it's got lots of different components to it, but I, I really consider it mindfulness therapy. In terms of the, uh, the, um, the theme of uh, the team approach and community, um, which you've seen here, I just want to share a little bit about the community that I built over the years. I'm 22 years sober now, and when I first got sober, um, I did not go to treatment. I didn't even know that treatment existed. And I'm sure that in 1989, I wouldn't have landed in a place like this with people talking the way they've been talking today. Um, so uh, who knows? Maybe it would have helped. I don't know. But I did get and stay sober. And I just started to build a team around me without thinking, I'm going to build a team around me. Because I realized that I have a lot of component parts. There's an interconnectedness, I believe, I come from a Buddhist perspective in a lot of ways, there's interconnectedness between things. There's also an interconnectedness inside of me. And that when any one of those things is not attended to, there is a chance that it will compromise the rest of the system. So I need to be um, willing to, I feel like I needed to be willing to seek out the different people and places and things that might attend to those different parts of me as I discovered them. So um, I had a therapist, his name was Simon Eccles, he passed away a couple of years ago. Um, it's great to have a therapist named Simon because when people ask you about how it's going, we say, Simon says, yeah. <laughs> anyway, he encouraged that. Anyway, Simon was this incredible spirit um, uh, who, who was not an alcoholic or an addict per se himself, um, and was not spiritual by any means. Like he, he did not, he just hated the whole idea of spirituality or religion for himself. But he was completely wonderful at opening that door for others. Like he didn't say, You're crazy, you think spirituality is good. He encouraged, like a lot of our speakers have talked about today, finding the door that you're going to open that's going to open your door. So he was great. And the other thing was, he, he was a chain smoker in session. I've never smoked in my life. Here's this guy. He's my wellness provider for my brain, right? And he's like, 
big belly. You know, all this, he, was a, uh, he was raised on a pig farm in West Virginia. He's like six foot five, weighed a lot, a lot of pounds. Um, became a therapist after he was, uh, he, what was his career? He was a country singer, he was an opera singer, he was an interior decorator, he was a personal assistant to John and Yoko, and then he became a therapist. Um, anyway, uh, Simon helped me immeasurably. If I had judgment about his smoking, or about his weight, or about any other part of him, I might have left that office. My job wasn't to you know, decide what pieces of wellness he needed to have. What my job was was to figure out that he had certain tools that spoke to my mind and to my emotions that healed me. And that's all I needed to know. I, of course, did a lot of prayer and a lot of other things that may have been within the scope of my being his patient or not to try and get him to stop eating and smoking. But, but other than that, all I know is that that man you know, changed my life. Um, I had a spiritual a Zen master, Roshi, who provided that aspect of things and taught me how to sit with myself and, and to, to reach that mindful place. Um, and he has his own challenges. I now know, and that does not stop me from knowing that everything that he taught me is within me and is now available to me to be part of that interconnectedness. Um, my monk friend, Sagan, who spoke here last year, uh, he was that sort of more on-call spiritual person for me. Um, my best friend, Mike, it's good to have a best friend, isn't it? Like when you're like 49 years old, to be like, my best friend, we're gonna go play now. Um, but he lives in the Berkshires, and he, he actually stumbled in his own service way. He has stumbled somewhat into the middle of the Occupy Wall Street movement, and has like splashed all over the news, so I get to see him kind of every other night on CNN. And he has been my best friend since I had about, not, for the last 22 years, essentially. And so he has always been there as a mirror, as a sounding board, as, as a comrade in arms, just all of this. The wellness that has come from that relationship is absurd. Um, my mom passed away uh, a year and a half ago. He was right there for me. His mom passed away about a month ago, and I'm there for him. And the, 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 the spirit that's there with the two of us. Um, my experiences in the workplace. I mean, it's, it's obvious and not obvious. Like, to work in a place like this and work with Bernie and work with the other people who work here, you know, we're, we're here as a community supporting our clients and supporting each other. And so it's sort of like, an e it's easy, I just show up to work, and it's like that. I've had jobs before where I joined communities where my wellness was taking. I, I was a high school English teacher, and I didn't come out as a recovering alcoholic to anyone in the community except for one person. So my sort of interaction with that community was a huge part of my just sort of becoming uh, quote unquote normal in the world, you know, in my early recovery where I could just be, you know, Steve, the English teacher, um, and not, um, necessarily have to wear my recovering alcoholic on my sleeve. And then there's the uh, there's a joke in New York. Uh, I don't know if they tell it here that um, AA is. They said it was a bridge back to life. In fact, it's a tunnel to other 12-step programs. And so I joined a lot of those other programs. And so the people and the tools and and what's in those other programs have been another part of you know my giant sort of mandala of. Recovery. I guess I want to maybe just start to wrap it up in a sense. Um, there's a lot of different interpretations of the, they're called the four foundations of mindfulness. There's a lot of ways of reading them in Buddhism. And um, one of them is mindfulness of body. And I was talking about that before with the, like, I think I need a cheeseburger. Um, mindfulness of body really becomes becoming mindful of the fact that I am a human being. Like, not trying to be superhuman and not trying to be subhuman. Like, this is who I am. This is where I am in this, in this whole picture. And just accepting and working with that in me. Mindfulness of life. Cutting through the whole survival mechanism and cutting through the whole fight or flight, cutting through 
the grasping at things to try and make it so that I don't die. Because that's how I am as a traumatized person, as an addict, is that I will think that I'm going to die when you look at me cross-eyed. And so I'll go into an addiction, or I'll go into fear, I'll go into this, I'll go into that. So if I can become mindful of that that's part of me too, I can just attend to that. Oh, that's my survival instinct. That's my fear. That's my... That's my, that's what happened when I was four, and now I'm not four. What's next? You know, people like Bernie, other EMDR therapists, I'm actually, myself, I'm in somatic experiencing therapy, which is another form of trauma therapy, because I want to continue to sort of release that stuff in a way that uh, allows me to kind of uh, do my do in, in a very uh, focused and calm way. A mindfulness of effort, which is uh, discipline, really, right? And discipline, a lot of people are scared of discipline. I just mean, you know, I show up. You know, I'm mindful of what I'm to do, and I do it. And uh, finally, um, mindfulness of mind, which is the most important one. Mindfulness of consciousness, which is, I think, the core of mindfulness and the core of AA. It's kind of one of the more brilliant things that the early AA people came up with is this idea of one thing at a time, one moment at a time, one day at a time. It's counterintuitive for a lot of people. How can I do that? I need to plan for the future. We don't say you're not gonna plan for the future. You're gonna mindfully, one moment at a time, plan for the future as part of your moment at a time. So taking it down to a moment at a time does what Eileen Getty and some of the other speakers said today, it slows everything down. It puts you in a position to be completely present with every action and every thought that you have. If I'm doing that, there is no room for past tripping and future tripping. If I'm not past tripping and I'm not future tripping, I'm not anxious and depressed. I'm just in the moment. I like to think that at 180, what we're doing is we are taking that idea and expanding it to the team. And that means the team of staff, 40 or more staff that we have here, but also all of those people that have spoken here today, all the people who came here today, all of us, by taking our best effort at taking it a moment at a time, are completely present for each other, interconnected with each other, a moment at a time, building a force of healing for all of us, all of our clients, and it spreads out to the rest of the community. And I mean that on, uh, on a very existential level, but I also mean that on a very practical level. Like just because Get Love is the one organization that we do the most work with doesn't mean that's the only place that we're having impact. The fact that Get Love and, and we work so closely together has an impact on thousands and thousands of more people, directly and indirectly. And I believe that that, and this is my own sort of prejudice, I believe that's a function of mindfulness, as really well described by uh, Dr. Kareem and, and others today, and Gurmuk. That if I'm able to um, take that as a solitary um, way of being and turn it into a team and community way of being, that's where that golden age that, that Gurmuk is talking about you know, can possibly exist. I guess the last thing I'll say is for anyone who's thinking, has investigated mindfulness or investigated any of these kind of practices, it does not matter what level of mindfulness you cultivate. If you cultivate one second of mindfulness in a day, that is one step closer to being able to stay connected with your true self and stay connected with all of that you're interconnected with. And I know that you know, I have my own day-to-day -day process, I'll even call it a struggle with it, and that I always just come back to the breath. The breath is what I started with when I popped out, cesarean, and the breath is, the, you know, is going to go all the way to the end, and it's gonna be very steady. So if I come back to that, that means I'm coming back to the moment. It's like default. So I just come back to the breath, 
and then take it from there. Come back to the breath, take it from there. Some days better than others. The first time I meditated, I was told to sit up, to sit down, shut up, and not move. That was the entire instruction I got. Very loving. And I, I did that, and the whole time I was sitting there going, I can't wait, wait, ring the bell, make this over, make this over, make this over. That was my meditation. My knee hurts, my knee hurts, my knee hurts. Stop it, stop it, stop it. It was actually a very successful meditation. That's what was going on in my mind at that time. I became mindful of that was what my mind was. And since then, my mind has become a little bit different, and a lot of that has been by being the most mindful that I can be on a day-to-day -day basis. So, um, sort of in complete closing of this and of Wellness Day in general, um, I just want to uh, wish everyone the opportunity, as I leave with it, the opportunity to um, give to others and by giving to others, giving to yourself, and the opportunity to um, see ourselves as, all of ourselves as healers. That each one of us has that capacity. And part of that capacity is that we actually have the capacity, and the newest studies of the brain actually back this up, that we have the capacity to heal ourselves but it really helps to have a lot of people around to help you not come up with cuckoo bird ideas like the ones I came up with very early on. And I can come up with them now too. So um, I wanna thank Bernie and Alex for making this place. I wanna thank Gina and Johnny and Amanda, the other members of the wellness community, uh, committee that put this event together. And I want to thank all of you who came to, to be with us, all the participants, the practitioners, and the speakers. And we'll see you next year at Wellness Day and probably before. So thank you. <laughs>